You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Where are we, Lionel? We are outside Vinoteca in London's King's Cross. Boom, we are. Well done. Uh, I'm with I'm Richard Moore, that's Lionel Burney, and we're with Daniel Freeb. Hello. Hello, Daniel. How's how, it going? How are you? Not too bad. Why? Why do you look sceptical, dubious already? Uh, Even before I've said anything. I don't know. Um, just natural state. Uh, here we are in London then, gathered a few days before the Vuelta. When do you head off, Daniel? Uh, Thursday. Lionel? Saturday morning. Flying in very late, Richard. Very relaxed for the holiday grand tour. Got your bucket and spade uh, <laughs> packed. I have, yeah. Um, wide-brimmed hat. Um, looking forward to Heading to which costa, Lionel? Uh, Tessa, I need to test you on your costas. Uh, well, it's, it's the Benidorm. Costa Coffee? No. <laughs> no, let's not mention that. It's the Costa Blanca. Correct. Yes. I had to think about that. The Costa del, Costa del Sol was last year. Costa Brava's a bit further up Correct. around the corner. What are the other costas? The Costa de Lazahar. Um, that's the one around Valencia. We're going there. Costa Dorada, which is a bit further up between Azahar and Brava. Three or four days in the Benidorm region, Daniel, to kick off the Vuelta. How do you feel about well, that? Well, I've tried to dodge that as uh, much as possible by staying south of Alicante, uh, which is the, the non-Benidorm side. Um, but it's, it's not the most pleasant part of Spain, is it? No, I'm looking forward to the bingo on Sunday afternoon. That'll be good. Uh, <laughs> I, think south of Ali- I always think south of Alicante is the sea, but actually, um, because I always think that the, the Costa... Blanca is the very south of Spain, but it's not really. It's the east coast. Yeah, it's on the side, isn't it? Um, Calpe's nice, though. I've never been in the height of summer, though. It could be a very different place um, when it's full of tourists. I mean, you only have to look at the number of hotels there are on that coast to know what it's going to be like in summer. I've never been there in the summer. I'm being critical of somewhere I've not been um, well, in the I was of the tourist season. there a couple of years ago when the Vuelta went through... Ben and Dorman finished just the other side of Calpe up that climb, um, which is called uh, Daniel. Um, I'll tell you who attacked on that oh, climb. The, oh no, oh, sorry. Was yeah. Richard Carapaz, and it was the first time I really sort of became aware of him a couple of years ago. But I remember the stage that day went through uh, Benidorm, and the, the the roads were lined with people in swimwear, um, holding plastic glasses of beer. It was wonderful. <laughs> that will be me on Sunday morning uh, when the stage starts there, I think, on Sunday morning. I mean, it, it zigzags around, doesn't it, on, um, on that coast. Uh, it kicks off, of course, with a team time trial on Saturday evening. We should tell people what sort of coverage they, they'll be getting from the cycling podcast at the Vuelta. We're going to be doing some podcasts, Richard. But The it, usual Grand Tour coverage is the answer, because uh, a few people have been asking. Um, and uh, we'll be producing daily episodes, nightly episodes, and nine episodes of Kilometre Zero, supported by Hans Grohe, again. Um, and so they'll come out Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and the nightly episodes will come out nightly. Yeah, it uh, could be slightly different to normal, though, couldn't it? I'm there for the first week. Richard, you're coming out on the... Uh, well, just in time for Andorra. I'll go home for the middle week, and then we'll both be in uh, the final few days I think the final four or five days Daniel you'll be there of course the whole race um, for ITV but joining us on the podcast as well and then well Orla Shenoui will be there as well working for Eurosport and well who else will we catch up with well Fran Race has been part of our coverage the last couple of years and Fran's now working for the organisation but we will hopefully speak to Fran at various points especially tap into his we expertise we planted him in the organisation no, we haven't planted him but we're going to have we put obviously a fox in the hen house <laughs> tap into his expertise on Spanish riders and teams so lots to look forward to are you going to do outside the team buses Lionel um, that's I'm, what that's the uh, question I'm going to do an experimental silent segment of the podcast called Lionel's Siesta that will come roughly two thirds of the way through I think the they episode. call that slow radio don't they <laughs> 
And then um, you do that during the Tour de France when Julian Pino was supposed to. <laughs> we were supposed to hear from Julian. Oh. Pino. No, <laughs> oh, we, there, we, we just we just left him out. We did. There wasn't there wasn't dead air oh, in, right. in, in its place. Um, outside the team bus will return in some form or other, as will um, an, an exciting new segment of, of by the pool. <laughs> Julian Pino um, was accidentally left out of an episode, Daniel, as you correctly point out. He was then inserted back in. So I'm um, just like to, to, to for, the, for the record. Um, do you have a news roundup? We'll, we'll be looking ahead to the uh, the Vuelta, obviously, later on. But there's there's been some other news in the cycling world this week. Yeah, starting off, Richard, with some sad news that Felice Gimondi, the Italian uh, legend, really, has died aged 76. It's fair to say he was one of the greatest riders of all time. Only the second man after Jacques Anquetil to win all three of the Grand Tours. He won the Tour de France, not only at, his f- at the first attempt, but during his first year as a professional rider. That was in 1965, and he was just 22 years of age. You could almost say, well, an achievement that... that sort of uh, better Egan Bernal's achievement in a way he also won the Giro d'Italia three times in 1967 69 <coughs> and 76 and he won the Vuelta in 1968 he was world champion in 73 he also won Milan San Remo Paris-Roubaix and the Giro di Lombardia a couple of times he was on holiday in Sicily last week and he suffered a heart attack while swimming and Eddie Merckx has led the tributes from the cycling world saying that with him goes a slice of my life we'll talk about Jim Mondi and his career and his legacy in the second part of today's podcast. In the first part, we'll talk about the big transfer that we've been anticipating for a while now, but which has been confirmed this morning. First of all, Team Sunweb announced that Tom Dumoulin will be leaving the team at the end of the year, and then very soon after, also on social media, Jumbo Visma sort of obliquely announced his arrival in quite a slick video that just uh, well ended with uh, with a picture of uh, a Jumbo Visma rider with Dumoulin. So. They're welcoming him on board for next season. A couple of other high-profile transfers confirmed in the past week. Ireland's Dan Martin is joining the Israel Cycling Academy and Lotto Sudal's Tish Banut is swapping to Sunweb. A couple of interesting ones there. Lots of racing going on, as we talked about last week. The Bink Bank Tour was dominated for the first three days by Sam Bennett of Bora Hansgrohe. He won the first three stages. Tim Wellens of Lotto Sudal then won in Hoofalese to take the leader's jersey. Alvaro Hodge was the only man to beat Bennett in a sprint. He won stage five, I think it was. Filippo Ganna. Great, a great race for the Celtic countries there, eh? With uh, Ireland and Scotland of course. to the Alvaro fore. Alvaro Hodge, the, the Scottish Argentinian. Yes, how could I forget? Um, Filippo Ganna of Team Ineos, the Italian time trial champion, won the short time trial stage. And then the race came down to its now traditional finish on the Moor in Herrasberg. And Oliver Narsen, Greg Van Avermaet and Lawrence de Plus fought it out. Narsen of AG2R won the stage and De Plus of Jumbo Visma fully recovered from his illness at the Giro now Richard before you mention anything well he rode a very good Tour de France <laughs> in the meantime true enough he took the overall victories to bump Wellens down to third place now the CPA the Riders Union has criticised the organisers of the Bink Bank Tour for among other things the narrow roads unmarked obstacles sudden bends in the road and holes in the road especially near the finishes they put out a press release saying that uh, the the safety of the race was suboptimal. There was also that extraordinary video, I don't know whether you saw it, of a member of the public pushing his own bike across a pedestrian crossing right in front of the bunch as they were coming. Quite miraculous that no one came down <laughs> there. Um, the CPA statement signs off by saying that it's become tired of being thanked for its report by the UCI while, as they see it, nothing is uh, done to improve rider safety. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that's rumbling on the Arctic Tour of Norway well it ended with a bit of beef between Warren Barguil and Enrico Gasparotto they were in a group behind two Norwegians who were up the road Alexei Lutsenko then got away and held a little gap to pinch the final time bonus and win the overall by a single second from Barguil who then blamed Gasparotto for letting Lutsenko's wheel go I mean well that's bike racing no but then apologised <laughs> to Gasparotto. Well, unless it's taken another twist well, today. You say it's by racing, but in, in that situation, should there not have been? Should he not have given some sort of warning that he was? I don't know. He sort of he sort of duped Barguil into thinking that he was going to follow um, Lutsenko. Of course, there, there was some. I've seen some speculation, perhaps valid, that um, there was possibly some kind of deal between Gasparotto or Lutsenko, or at least um, their 
friendship, the fact they were former teammates at Astana may have played some kind of role. I also thought, uh, Gasparotto, I don't know if you watched the first stage when Steve Cummings would, well, tried to get away um, two or three times in the finale and, and very nearly won the stage. I also thought Gasparotto didn't do a great job as a teammate there. Um, uh, I'd be keen to get your thoughts on this. The, the whole issue of, of sort of interfering with meddling with a chase when you're, um, when you're effectively protecting a teammate who's down the road we've seen it uh, we saw it a couple of times in the classes when uh, De Koenig Quickstep did it very well um, how much is that frowned upon is, should you systematically do that as a team as a teammate should you position yourself at the front of the bunch to sort of um, to, to, to kind of infiltrate the line of of chasers well, it does happen, doesn't it I mean, I you're mean I thought that was to possibly the difference between Cummings winning that stage and not winning it um, Van der Poel did eventually catch him and, and won the sprint. But I, I don't know, I thought Gasparotto was... Um, well, that maybe told us something about why Dimension Data have not been more successful this year. They weren't really working as a team there anyway. Well, as you say, Daniel, Matthew van der Poel did win the opening stage. That was on his return to road racing after a couple of wins in the Mountain Bike World Cup. Meanwhile, at the Vuelta a Burgos, Team Ineos's young Colombian Ivan Sosa won a couple of stages in the overall. Ben Hermans of Israel Cycling Academy won the Tour of Utah. The Women's World Tour had a couple of events at the weekend. The post-Nord Vorgorda team time trial was won by Trek Segafredo, who had Ruth Winder. Elisa Longo Borghini, Ellen Van Dyke, and Trixie Wadak in their team. They beat Canyon SRAM by 25 seconds. The WNT Rota team, including the former world champion Lisa Brenauer, were unable to take the start because they had a crash in the recon when a car, a public car, pulled out in front of them uh, and according to them uh, it was the riders right of way on the road uh, the riders were not injured but their bikes were damaged so they were unable to take part the one day race the following day was won by Italy's Martia Bastianelli ahead of Mariana Voss and Lorena Wiebus uh, a notable uh, a couple of items from the world junior track championships India won their first medal at world level taking the team sprint on the track in Frankfurt and Eleanor Baxted won three medals um, for Great Britain. Eleanor Baxted, of course, is the daughter of former Paris-Roubaix winner Magnus Baxted and former British rider Megan Hughes. More British success at the Tour de l'Avenir, where Ethan Hayter and Tom Pidcock did a 1-2 on one of the stages and Brid Wright won the following day. That race concludes at the weekend. Finally, Roman Bardet has ended his season. He's not racing uh, again this year but will continue to train as normal until the end of the season according to a uh, release from his team AG2R and the cycling podcast was named in the Daily Mail's 100 best podcast <laughs> thanks amongst, Daily Mail amongst some really uh, stellar um, other podcasts from all well, as you, you expect know, Lionel uh, top 100 uh, I mean yeah you, you expect that one other transfer, quickly, Victor Campenarts. An email has just confirmed his move to Dimension Data. Just before we end the news roundup, Lionel, um, important news. It's not really news, but we'll, uh, we'll flag it as news. Um, our Grand Tour, well, our events that we've got coming up, starting at the World Championships. Yeah, well, it is news because our Grand Tour oh, yes, lineup is right. confirmed at long last. Um, but before that, we'll be at the World Championships at the Royal Hall in Harrogate on Friday, September the 27th. Lots going on in Harrogate that week. I think Ned Bolting and David Miller are doing an event as well. Shouldn't, shouldn't plug that, should we, really? <laughs> we, we hope people will come along to both events. No, it won't. Or we? just, or just ours. Or just ours, if it comes down to a choice, of course. Yeah. Um, all tickets, by the way, as the thunder rumbles above us, wow. it, are available from links from thecyclingpodcast.com and go to live events, which is in the menu tab. Now, the Grand Tour, we have two um, venues to announce, one in Dublin, and one in Cambridge. A, home, a homecoming gig for you, Lionel. Oh, well, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My my first engagement in Dublin as, a, as an Irish citizen, indeed. Um, but we will be, in November, darting around from Bristol to Cardiff to Worcester. Dublin, as I say, Belfast, 
two dates at the London Art Theatre in Leicester Square. We sold out there a couple of years ago. We're there on consecutive Mondays. We'll be in Cambridge at the West Road Concert Hall, then up in Edinburgh at Churchill Theatre, then Leicester and then Manchester. The dates are between November the 11th and November the 30th. Uh, the full list of dates is on our website, as I say. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com slash live hyphen events. And please do come along and see us. Quick up- update on tickets. Oh, um, yes. Harrogate is selling extremely well. We're going to have a big crowd in Harrogate. So thanks very much to everyone who's bought tickets for that. There's still more available because it's a big, big venue um, Belfast and Bristol are racing ahead um, so thanks very much to people who bought tickets there Worcester though come on Worcester if you're in Worcester or you can get well, to Worcester probably not I mean we don't seem to have any listeners to the podcast I mean we've sold some tickets but not many so well, come on Worcester come, yeah we, we, we want to see a big crowd in Worcester as well very much looking forward to our tour around the Worcester country Worcester sauce the fastest clothing in the world tour the home of cycling with character Ride and watch with Ratha in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon SRAM. Thank you very much indeed to our headline sponsor, Rafa. Uh, you mentioned in the news roundup, Lionel, briefly, the Tour of Utah. A um, couple of successes there for EF Education First. Joe Dombrowski won the final stage and Lachlan Morton. Um, I was at the Tour of Utah last time he won there and he won the overall. And it was, well been a while since we've seen him win on the road but of course he's been doing lots of other things and a reminder that if you want to see a truly remarkable exploit it's his ride from Land's End to John O'Groats as part of the GB Juro and that was a a 30 minute film made by Rafa Um, a really great watch a really great insight into Lachlan Morton and his personality and you know fascinating to see him go from that to carrying his bike across bogs to winning our stage at the Tour of Utah um, and good to see him win again actually you'll find all the EF uh, Gone Racing films at rafa.cc or on the Rafa channel on YouTube um, now the big news today is Tom de Moulin's confirmed move to Jumbo Visma um, as you said we've seen it coming it's been rumoured uh, over the summer Sunweb we're playing a pretty straight bat at the Tour de France saying that, you know, as far as they were concerned, he was under contract for another few years. He signed a long-term contract with them, but that's been broken. Uh, a move that I suspect is very, very important for Jumbo Visma, a Dutch team which had a great year, um, but really needed that Dutch figurehead, didn't it? Um, yeah, it did, Rich. Although Stephen Kreiswijk obviously finished on the podium in Tour de France and, um, and I think it's, well... It's about this dream of having a, a Dutch Tour de France winner, um, also you know, having a team which can compete on every front really, particularly as far as the Grand Tours are concerned. And um, they've obviously got the money to be able to afford uh, Tom Dumoulin. Um, they've also, well, they're heavily, they've heavily invested Jumbo supermarkets in speed skating, haven't they? I think they've heavily invested in Formula One with Max Verstappen. Um, they've got some kind of sponsorship on some level with with him. I don't. I'm not particularly au fait with Formula One, but I'm told that's the case. Um, and it's it's not that surprising um, in in this respect. But on the other hand, it's a team well which has had wild success really this year, particularly in in the Tour de France. With um, how many stage wins did they get in the end? Was it five or six? Um, four or five well, Mike Tony Turnison on day one the, of course the, the team, time, team trial. time trial Dylan Grunewagen Dylan Grunewagen Wout van Aert and then they finished on the podium as well um, so <laughs> what the, uh, one of the most intriguing aspects of this move is the question of how they're going to fit how they're going to sort of circle the square um, with Roglic who um, finished on the podium in the Giro and Kreiswijk and now Dumoulin as well um, they've all got designs you would think on the Tour de France they've all sort of served their apprenticeship in the, the minor Grand Tours um, and they, they will all want to well they all feel that they can compete for victory in the Tour de France so that's my reading of it on the other hand Kreiswijk I mean I spoke to some Dutch colleagues this year they felt that um, his podium finish at the Tour was the result of a lifetime and um, he might be well happy with that everything that comes now is a bonus maybe he will turn his attention to winning one of the major tours the other major tours and um, obviously came very close a couple of years ago at the Giro so you know I, I mean my reading of it is that they will have a sole leader at the Giro um, and there will be 
they will certainly have two leaders at the Tour de France, Dumoulin and w one other maybe. But we also know that Dumoulin loves the Giro. Will he go back there? I think a lot de will depend on the courses that are unveiled in the autumn. Yeah, the interesting thing is that Jumbo Visma's kind of attempts to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Team Ineos in the Grand Tours is um, taken another step forward in a big way hasn't it I mean we've seen well we've talked about Team Ineos having so many different riders who are capable of um, winning a Grand Tour and obviously we can't take for granted the level that Chris Froome comes back at next year but it could well be that they would have uh, Froome, Thomas, Bernal, the three most recent winners of the Tour de France, plus the defending Giro champion Richard Carapaz, um, all available for selection for the Tour de France next year, or have all of those cards to play. Jumbo Visma are trying to kind of match that, and I think maybe that's uh, a realization on their part. And going back to your special at the start of the year, Richard, where you know the, the takeaway from that was that they weren't going to mess about in terms of trying to win the Tour de France and signing Tom de Moulin, a rider who has won the Giro and finished on the podium at the Tour, second place at the Tour, is, is a serious, serious move. And I think the point you make about Stephen Kreuzwick is a good one. Marin Zayman, the coach at Jumbo Visma, um, spoke to him on the Champs-Élysées about Kreuzwick and he is the sort of... Um, the, the heart and soul of that team in in a lot of ways you know he's been their project for a number of years as 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 is Roglic actually um, and Zayman was quite honest saying that he wasn't sure whether Kreuzwick could move up a level from from this year from finishing on the podium at the tour I think that is the realization of of a dream with him and his role might subtly alter now he might be realistic in um you know he's going to the Vuelta what in what looks like a support role for Roglic and that might be his his role I think also the result Lawrence de Plus is very significant at the Bink Bank Tour 23 years old moved from De Kuhn and Quick Step and I think had some reservations himself about whether that was a wise move and it has been apart from the Giro which was a disappointment for him he wrote I mean he was man of the match for Jumbo Visma at the Tour de France he was exceptional there and to go from performing as he did there in the high mountains to winning a race like the Bing Bang Tour it was a real all-rounder sort of race I think at 23 he's also potentially a future Grand Tour contender yeah, and we've talked a lot in the last couple of years about um, eight-man teams in Grand Tours and the, the different um, problems that poses to team managers and uh, you think about Jumbo Visma and you think about the, the amount of quality they they managed to pack into their Tour de France roster this year and also Rich um, Lionel mentioned your special earlier in the year but this vision that their manager Richard Plugger had of being competitive on every single day of the Tour de France of um, you know a he almost had an epiphany two or three years ago that he no longer wanted to go to the Tour de France and um, not being competitive every single day, not having a chance to win the stage. Um, and you would think that in order to fulfill that equation, you have to have a sprinter, a frontline sprinter, which they've had with Gronewegen, but you throw a second bona fide leader into the mix, GC leader, and you also say that our objective is going to be to win the Tour de France, is the space for Gronewegen. I mean, you can almost pick the team now, um, with George Bennett, Wout van Aert, Mike Toynesen maybe, um, Lawrence de Plus, Gronewegen, Martin Kreiswijk and Dumoulin, but then already, I mean, if we're talking about the Tour de France, um, Gronewegen will lose a man and he'll, that would be Janssen, the, the Norwegian um, <coughs> lead out man that he had this year. Um, is that a sacrifice that he's willing to make? Is that a sacrifice that um, will still allow him to compete for the sprint stages? Not sure. And I mean, you also have to look just practically at the riders' contracts. Um, Gronewegen is, is, is under contract for another year at least. Roglic has got another year and um, it's been reported today that he's got a verbal agreement going beyond that, maybe until 2023, I think. So, I mean, I think that they'll all still be there next year and there probably will be someone who will be slightly aggrieved when the, the selections are made for the Tour de France and the Giro. Um, but I don't think it's, in, it's an impossible um, circle to square. Square to circle? Circle to square. Hmm, good Good question. Circle to square. Well, they've got a kind of triangle of 
genuine podium contenders there now, haven't they? Um, I think the way they rode the last few days of the Tour de France was quite instructive in a way. They really laid it on to bump Krasweik up to third place and his delight at being third. And perhaps you're right, knowing that that might be the limit of, of, of where he could get to um, overall and perhaps never get a better chance to finish on the podium. But it does strike me that Krausweich is exactly the... He has the attributes of the perfect, you know, super mountain domestique. Um, you know, he can ride a very steady, hard, fast pace. We don't tend to see him on the front too much because he's the protected man. But, you know, he has that, he has that energy that energy that engine to um you could see him if he if he's kind of you know the ego side of his personality could dedicate himself to somebody else he could be extremely valuable well i think that's why maybe the the podium place was very important and we'll see over the next few weeks at the vuelta um maybe how uh, prepared he is because at the tour last year and at the vuelta last year he was writing very much for his own gc ambitions um he may feel he's got another GC riding him at the Vuelta um, but Roglic is there as, as the obvious leader and they might ride in a similar way where they're both kind of up there or it might be that Kreuzwick is required to actually sacrifice himself to help Roglic. Um, there could be an interesting clue there but I mean the other aspect of this move is, is De Mula and I think you know with his talent and ability um, this is an obvious move for him and it's got to increase his chances of winning another Grand Tour because the question about the Moulin has always been about team support, really. Yeah, um, what it does also do is leave some web in a bit of an invidious position um, in the sense that you know, two years ago, and this really shows how, how quickly things can change in cycling, two years ago, some web were the toast of the, of the peloton, really, with the season they'd had with Dumoulin winning the Giro and just a fantastic season all round. Baggy all winning a couple of stages at the Tour. Michael Matthews doing well at the Tour. Um, and, and now all of a sudden they look a little bit directionless. And, you know, this is also um, the latest in a sequence of big names that they have lost either, well, at the end of their, their contracts or... or in Dumoulin's case and in Marcel Kittel's case and I think Warren Barguil's case as well before the, the contracts actually um, ran out and and we've discussed this before the, the sort of environment that Sunweb is they, they sort of pride themselves on on well they have this this mantra don't they this hashtag keep challenging and they really try to put that into practice and there's a lot of um, sort of questioning of riders a lot of trying to tweak their approach um, uh, a lot of communication between coaches, directors, sportives, the, the management, and we've said before it's not for everyone, or, and it's not for everyone at every stage of their career. It tends, it seems to work well with riders who are who are sort of on the up as far as their trajectory, their sort of bell curve is concerned, but less so maybe with riders when they've reached their plateau. I mean, on some web, uh, it's worth mentioning Mark Hershey, who has been a bit of a revelation the last few weeks, rode very well at the Bink Bank Tour as well. And they've got a few young riders coming through. Tish Benoit is obviously going there now. Um, uh, Leonard Kamna was very good at the, at the Tour de France. They've got a few young riders, but yeah, they don't have... I mean, De Moulin was such an obvious, um, uh, you know, talisman for them. Without him... It, it punches a big hole in their in their lineup. And just on that issue, Rich, of the of big names leaving um, slightly unexpectedly in a lot of cases, um, it was something I discussed actually with Ivan Speckenbrink, the manager of Sunweb, a couple of years ago when John Degenkolb was about to leave uh, Team Sunweb. I mean, if you look to our industry, industry, our sport, cycling, is we have a bunch of talents, talented riders, but so has the the competition. They have a bunch of talented riders. And then we have a bunch of talents also in terms of coaches, experts, etc. But they have as well. So at that moment, we're still not speaking about top sports. We're still speaking about a collection of talents racing us. And so when it becomes from, from collective gathered talent to real top sport, it means to, we need to have the best possible plan. And the best possible plan in such a, in such a tough sport that means uh, you need to be very, very committed to it. It's a very demanding approach. Uh, we call it the keep challenging approach. But we e always have to optimize, let's say, the teamwork, the cooperation, and always keep innovating. And it asks a lot from people to do that with all your colleagues. Um, so in a way, and, and for sure for young riders, we, we, uh, 
it, it goes over the years and we stretch it step by step gradually that they do more and more in training more and more in nutrition more and more in aerodynamics and, and biomechanics more and more in teamwork you cannot all of a sudden put all of that on a young rider you have to stretch it and, and one can do more than the other but that's how we how we work so you need personalities who really are ambitious and who really want to give it everything and and uh, yeah young talents they, they they have the dream still ahead of them they are really motivated and they're really committed um, and as long as people uh, uh, want to give the full hundred percent they stay welcome in a team the moment we see uh, the learning curve of the let's say the, the level of commitment is getting a little bit less because they have arrived at a certain level they are happy they want to take some comfort out of it it's very good and we understand those choices however that's not strengthening let's say the pure elite sports culture we have in our team based on in constant innovation and, and, and cooperation um, and the same for and the same for uh, the staff we, we need that people um, who, who know everything we need people who want to know more tomorrow we need people who really strive and are really driven to not be the best one but become the best one and stay the best one in the future so that was Speckenbrink, the general manager at Team Sunweb, who's been, it's his vision that's, that's driven that team all the way through the, the Argos Shimano years, the giant Shimano, the Team Sunweb years. And Demula moving on does kind of end a, end a bit of an era, doesn't it? It does, Rich. Uh, you know, we mentioned Kittel, Degenko, Bargiel, and Dumoulin. They were the, 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 the four big stars, really, that that team, that nursery, that sort of talent factory produced um you know there are still um one or two domestiques who have been there pretty much for the duration roy curvers is still there um but it, it is it's the end of an era the end of a cycle for somewhere and and i'm sure their philosophy is going to stay more or less the same but personnel wise they really have to reinvent themselves to a certain extent now shoot uh, shoot that arrière du peloton cycling podcast team car the back of the pack please that's Seb PK, the voice of Radio Tour, to remind us to tell you that this episode of the Cycling Podcast is sponsored by Harry's, Harry's Razors. I'm glad to hear Seb back in his usual duties there, not trolling me about a uh, France-Scotland rugby match at the weekend that he was at. Uh, did, did France, by any chance, beat Scotland at rugby? Quite heavily. Oh dear, oh dear. It wasn't a close shave. Oh, nice, no, Lionel. No. Stick to um, stick to interrupting our episodes to remind the listeners that this week's episode is sponsored by, in this case, Harry's. Please, Seb. Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, no, know, know your place, Seb. Well, Richard, the Vuelta is coming up very soon. Are you all packed for your stint? Not only packed, Lionel, but my stock of Harry's razors has been replenished recently. Uh, first thing in the, you know, you get first name on the team sheet, first item in the wash bag my spare cartridges uh, is that what you call them? Cart- they're little cartridges that appear with fresh razor blades just when I need them just so that I don't have that you know the, one of these things you forget in the supermarket along with batteries razor blades so I've got my razor blades for the Vuelta well any of our listeners can also get their hands on some Harry's razor blades there is a special offer for cycling podcast listeners you can get a full trial set for just £3.95 all you have to do is go to harrys.com slash cycling and you will get delivered to your door the weighted ergonomic handle five precision engineered blades with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade rich lathering shave gel and a travel blade cover um how are they so cheap there's no line on but they're excellent razors I should say as well feel that I'm, I'm not touching your face Richard sorry sorry I'll do a lot of things for the success of the podcast but touching your face is not one of them no matter how smooth it is so if you want to be as smooth as Richard go to harrys.com slash cycling right now that's harrys.com slash cycling and get your trial set of Harry's razors for three pounds ninety five well, there was very sad news uh, in the last week as well with the death of Felice Gimondi, the great Italian uh, champion. And uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't that old, was he? And uh, he had a, a sort of a real air about him. Um, he was one of these, these people that almost um, grows into his age a little bit, if you know what I mean. He always looked very elegant. And uh, Daniel, you must have spoken to him uh, when you did your Eddie Merckx book because he features quite quite a lot in that 
Yeah, he does. Um, there was this well, I had this great moment when I was uh, researching the my book on Eddie Mertz, which was supposed to be really as much about the people who the, the writers whose whose career that Mertz had almost sabotaged as about Mertz himself. And Gimondi was foremost really among those riders. Um, as we mentioned, as Lionel you mentioned in the news roundup, he won the Tour de France in 1965 and. Um, as a neo pro, 22 years old, and everyone believed, certainly the Italian media and the Italian public believed at that stage that Gimondi was destined to dominate professional cycling. Um, he'd finished third in his first Giro d'Italia, so four or five months into his professional career, he'd finished third in the Giro and then gone straight to the Tour, won that. So, you know, it was, it was legitimate to, to believe that this was the guy who was going to dominate cycling for the next few years. And then, and then Merckx came along and, and changed the narrative, really. And um, it was a really intriguing period those those years in the late 60s when Merckx was sort of moving through the gears and um, Gimondi found himself well mystified himself as to why he wasn't dominating um, and it really came to a head well, Gimondi told me that it came to a head in the 1968 Volta a Catalunya of all races the Volta a Catalunya back then used to take place in the September and um, it was one of these great races of which there have probably been dozens over the years that um, they weren't televised and, and they've almost been forgotten but that was really where this budding rivalry between Gimondi and Merckx came to a head and it, the, the leadership sort of went back and forth and then Merckx beat Gimondi in a time trial for the, for the first time and Gimondi spoke to me very poignantly and uh, very vividly about the, the time trial and Merckx beating him um, the first time he'd lost to Merckx in a time trial and spending that whole evening or after dinner that evening going down um, or out of his team hotel and just sort of pacing up and down the beach racking his brains um, it was a beach called Playa de Rosas in, in Catalonia um, racking his brains as to what he could do how he how he could possibly come to terms with um, the fact that there was a rider now who was better than him stronger than him um, and he said he spent hours just trying to trying to wrap his head around it and, and eventually um, whether that night or over the next few weeks and months he came to the realisation that he was never going to be better than Merckx and, and he was really going to be feeding off scraps for the next few years and, and that's what he did and, and he picked up some, some very prestigious uh, scraps along the way as you said Lionel um, in your roundup, you know a fantastic Palmares nine podiums in the, I think nine podiums in a row in the Giro d'Italia um, the first, I looked the other day his first 18 Grand Tours he finished in the top 10 only the last two he didn't finish in the top 10 so um, an incredibly consistent rider as you said Rich a very sort of graceful man um, a, a very gentle man particularly in his, in his later years which was not how he'd been as a rider he was very tenacious um, but he had a real sort of a, a calm, kind of soothing air about him. And um, from Bergamo, lived there all his life. He was a real institution in the Bergamo area. Um, he'd actually learned to, to ride a bike well, on, his, on his mother's bike. His, his mother had been, I think I read um, or, or I heard once, one of the first um, post women in Italy. And she did all of her deliveries on her bike, come rain or shine. And Felice used to steal his mum's bike, a big sort of sit up and beg, you know, 20 kilos. Uh, affair and that's how he he learned to ride and then um, as I said he, he spent his whole life in the Bergamo area and Bergamo in the 90s really was the sort of center of 80s 90s was the center of the universe as far as um, professional cycling was concerned um, riders in the same way that they now flock to Andorra and, and um, Nice um, it had a huge and incredible concentration of professional cyclists that lived there and and Gimondi was sort of the archduke of that whole scene the sort of Zeus figure of, of cycling in in Bergamo. Yeah, you mentioned Bergamo. That's the only time I saw Felice Gimondi in the flesh was when the Giro was in Bergamo a couple of years ago and he came into the press room. And I think if you, you had to... Uh, not that I can paint, but if you if if I was given the task of of uh, creating an oil painting of a stereotypical legendary retired Italian pro who'd really looked after himself in later life, you, you would come up with Felice Gimondi, wouldn't you? He's you know he had the sort of the streak of silver in the in the jet black hair, and um, you yeah, imagine him in a well cut suit. He was wearing a well-cut yeah. suit, exactly, yeah. And, uh, well, one thing that just sprung to mind last week was um, 
if you are of the generation of cyclists who bought VHS videos of 20 years ago from Cycling Weekly, there was one French documentary called Pour un Maillot Jaune for a yellow jersey. It's only about 20 minutes long by French film director Claude Lelouch. I'm not going to try and describe um, the, the, the style of the film because it's, it's pretty esoteric, um, but I've just looked on YouTube and it is actually on YouTube if anyone wants to watch it, search for Pour un Maillot Jaune. The film is not about Gimondi, but you do get um, a sense of Gimondi's style both on and off the bike in in that film. Something that might not be online, but one of my most vivid kind of pictures, mental pictures of Gimondi is a, a bike review that Robert Miller did for Pro Cycling Magazine many years ago. Um, I think uh, testing a Bianchi with, with, with the brand with which Gimondi was very associated and he went for a bike ride with Gimondi and just spent most of the bike review describing what it was like to ride with Gimondi and, and to sort of breathe in his air and and, and I think I, the sense I had was of a, a, a man still... It, you know, I guess this would have been like almost 20 years ago. So he'd have been in his in his early 50s at the time, and probably still very fit. And and um, a real you know sort of elegance about him on on the bike then as well. And that's that's one of my most vivid pictures of of, of him. But I don't think that I don't think you'll find that online. I, I don't imagine. I doubt it. I, I, I sh- should also have said, Rich, that when I did interview Jimoni for my Merck's book, um, it was in the VIP enclosure. I think in Macunaga at the 2011 Giro d'Italia and it was very serendipitous for me and very fortunate in the sense that um, I was interviewing Jimondi and, and who should come and sit down with us but Merckx um, who, was, who was also there that day and of course this led into this uh, the, 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 conversation them reminiscing about in particular that Volta Catalunya that I, I mentioned and there was a real warmth and there has always been a real warmth between Jimondi and Merckx and um, Merckx said the other day that um, that this time he'd lost in their rivalry because he'd lost a great friend in Jimondi and Axel Merckx also I noticed he tweeted something very um, a, a, a very fond message um, a homage to Jimondi on um, the, the, the day after he died so um, someone who'll be remembered with, with great affection by the whole Italian cycling community and uh, the cycling community beyond Italy well, at the Vuelta, we will once again be selling the beautiful mugs uh, made by Stacy Snyder, the ceramicist from Virginia in the US. Um, well, we'll not be selling them. She'll be selling them directly. Um, you'll find them on her website or through her Etsy site. Um, details in our newsletter. If you're not subscribing to our newsletter, please do so. Sign up at cyclingpodcast.com. Uh, we'll put details in there about how to buy the mugs and when they will go on sale they'll be on sale at a precise time during stage one of the Vuelta uh, that'll be the first batch the second batch will go on sale later in, in the race assuming the first batch sell out but the indications at the Giro and the Tour suggest that they will um, raising money for good causes now um, lots of money was raised at the Giro and the Tour for some great causes the time has come to select your from your nominations again. We had lots of nominations again, none from the US this time. And we have tried to support good causes in the US because Stacey is obviously based over there, but we didn't get any from the US this time. Um, the, a few that caught her eye, a few really good ones. Um, one was from Ian Sisson, who suggested that... Uh, um, uh, Bjorg Lambrecht, uh, a charity in his name or a fund in his name would be a, a great choice and it, and it would I got in touch with Lotus Sudal um, it's a bit too early I think for Lambrecht's family to have, have chosen a, a charity or to set up a fund in his name so maybe that's one for the future but it was a, a great suggestion um, the two that we will be supporting um, one comes from Stephen Tunstall um, he nominates the Bike Project uh, operating in London and Birmingham Project collects old and unwanted bikes, fixes them up and donates them to refugees. Stephen himself is a volunteer bike buddy with the charity. That means he accompanies refugees after they receive a bike to help them build up confidence on the roads. Half of the beneficiaries are from Syria, Eritrea or Sudan. So Stephen sent us a few quotes as well from people who have benefited from the bikes. It's a bit different this one, but we're very happy to support um, the bike project. Uh, the other one which caught my eye, it's a very nice email from Garrett Tur- Turley. Um, hope I've said your name correctly, Garrett. Um, it's Andy's Man Club. Um, 
He writes, in February, my best friend and my cycling buddy, Peter Hanlon, killed himself after years of mental health issues. He left behind three boys. He was 50. Um, after the immediate pain reduces, the ripples from this tragedy will be still be felt 50 years from now by those boys. This is a bit of a long email, but I'm going to read it in full because it, I find it quite, quite moving. Uh, Peter and I would go cycling every year abroad for a long weekend in the mountains in France, but mainly in Italy. And on those trips, he could escape the pain of his mind and focus on the pain in his legs. His wife and eldest son describe those trips as the happiest days of his year and his wife is also sure that it was only due to the thought of those the training for them and the pleasure he derived from them that he stayed alive so long I feel immense sadness about his death but I'm pleased I was able to help him more than I had perhaps fully understood this is because Peter never really spoke to me of his problems even though he was my best friend and I was his that's in turn because he was a man and ridiculously we don't talk much as you will know suicide is the biggest cause of death in men from 18 to 45 Andy's Man Club is a charity that encourages and facilitates men talking about their problems in an effort to head off this disaster. You've recently had a few podcasts that have covered or mentioned the early deaths of cyclists, both male and female, from suicide. But there's another side. I know from my own cycling club that many men use cycling as a form of therapy to deal with work, relationship or health issues for themselves or ones close to them. The act of cycling, when you're looking forward rather than making direct eye contact, actually enhances open conversation and allows people to decide whether to tentatively open and explore issues on their own terms. After Peter died, I wondered what I could do to help beyond helping his family. One of my ideas was to sponsor one of your podcasts. Peter loved the podcast, of course. Um, but he has in- instead suggested that we support Andy's Man Club as the, one of the charities, one of the good causes from the sale of the mugs. So uh, those are our two good causes for mug sales from the Vuelta. And as I say, if you want details of how to buy them and when to buy them, please subscribe to our newsletter um, at thecyclingpodcast.com and we'll put the details on social media as well. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. Always very much appreciated, um, especially around Grand Tour time because they came on board with us in 2016 at the Giro d'Italia and have been with us ever since. Fueling us all the way and you because they offer 25% off uh, to you, the listener, at scienceandsport.com with the code Lionel. SISCP25. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. The, uh, robot, the robot may return at the Welter. The, the Spanish robot <laughs> with a, a Spanish accented uh, discount code for Science and Sport. But thank you to them. And uh, we're looking ahead to the Vuelta. Uh, well, you guys are out there for the, for the early shift. Um, but the Vuelta is on past well, recent history, a race that sort of bursts into life pretty early on, doesn't it? Um, traditionally, with the, the way the, the course is and so on, it doesn't have the, well, certainly this year, the Giro, um, it, it, was a, it was a slow burn, wasn't it? The, the Giro, if it, if it ever actually began burning at all. Uh, the Vuelta is more of a kind of firecracker. It, it, it gets um, off to an interesting start and, and carries on and and it's it looks like a very open race i mean we've got i think two exceptionally strong teams haven't we uh Jumbo Visma with Roglic and Kreuzwick and uh, Astana have announced quite a surprisingly strong team with Jakob Fulsang who crashed out the tour <coughs> he's back for the Vuelta um alongside Miguel Angel Lopez Superman indeed it's the return of Superman <laughs> oh good and the Whalers <laughs> and the Superman and the Whalers oh we've missed Superman haven't we um but yeah I mean what 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 are we expecting from this Vuelta uh you well, you, two, you, what, Rich, you two have studied the opening week and um, just off the top of my head here are the the 18 riders most likely to win a stage in descending order. Oh my uh, goodness. Sam Bennett, Fer- Fernando Gaviria, Primoz Roglic, Valverde, Fabio Jakobsen, Carapaz, Superman, Stiba, I've got number eight, uh, Naira Quintana, Esteban Chavez, Philippe Gilbert, Max Valchide, Jakob Fulsang, Steven Kreiswijk, Thomas de Gen, Luca, M- Luca Mezgec, Dylan Toynes, and Pierre Latour. You could have said Jumbo Visma for the team time trial on day one. Uh, I, w- I didn't count that. Oh, okay. Well, Daniel famously dismissed Jumbo Visma's chances of winning a team time <laughs> trial, <laughs> exactly, if you recall, yeah. before the exactly. tour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, in our press conference before the tour, somebody suggested Jumbo Visma might be a good shout for the team time trial, and you you poo pooed that I idea after I after I suggested that it was a very good suggestion indeed. You guys, have you studied the opening week, the the course before yes. we go into the riders? Yeah, what, I have. What can well, we expect? Uh, course and riders um, uh, opens with a what could be quite a spectacular team time trial down in Torre Vieja. Um, lots of water w- in in view, I think, of the course. It kind of. Extremely comes down dis- to a, a bit of a marina, I think. Extremely disappointing opening team time trial in that it's clashing with the Arsenal Liverpool game. Oh, come off it! Come off it, Daniel. That's ir- irrelevant. There'll be lots of pubs around there showing that. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> oh, that's true. They will. Yeah. Don't you worry. I'll be suddenly, in and suddenly and chirped I'll be up. In and out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, Theo Gagan Hart, of course, is an Arsenal supporter, isn't he? Hopefully, hopefully, he'll have his eyes on the team time trial more than you will, um, Daniel, for Team Ineos. But Sam Bennett is fresh from three stage wins at the Bink Bank Tour. He's won a stage of every stage race, well, at least one stage of every stage race he's done this year, except the Tour of Romandy, where he finished second. They basically didn't bring in the, the, the breakaway. Stefan Kuhn won the stage and Bennett won the sprint for second but he's really been remarkably consistent and well his whole year has been defined by the fact that Bora Hansgrohe left him out of both the Giro d'Italia and Tour de France teams uh, we don't yet know what Bennett will be doing next season but he uh, well he he will he will feel that um, he has a point to prove and show that he is capable of winning uh, at the very highest level and um, Bora Hansgrohe have been pretty remarkable in the sense that they've won stages of 13 of the 15 World Tour races so far this season. That's more even than De Kerning Quickstep, who have won in 10 of the 15 stage races. So you would have to say uh, Sam Bennett looks good for these opening two or three stages, which feature climbs towards the end, but um, are likely to finish in the sort of sprint where a strong man, uh, as they used to say in the old days, a roadman sprinter will come to the fore. It doesn't have a lot of help. I don't know if that will matter a lot, but it's not a team that's been built to really offer him an awful lot of support. Shane Archbold is there, um, but not a lot. Not a lot. Yempi Drucker, maybe. We don't see big trains no. in the world to do with. No, we don't. True. Course-wise, Napalm, I mean, one thing that stood out for me is that you don't, with the Vuelta, typically, and this is certainly the case this year, you don't get um, the, the sort of the, the crescendo towards a mountain range, then transition, then another mountain range, then basically the end of the race it's there are mountains sort of dotted throughout the the 21 days um in terms of sort of sort of um continuous uh tranches in the mountains that one of the biggest ones is at the end of the first week um in the mountains sort of inland from the costa del azahar so the sort of valencia area and um, the Havalambre finish um, which is a kind of a Tour de France style climb on stage five, 11 kilometers at 7.8%. Um, then uh, a very, very steep finish, which we've been to before in 2016 um, on stage seven, Mas de la Costa. I um, don't know if you remember that. I remember that mainly because um, Leopold Koenig was, Koenig was in with a shout for a stage win that day, riding for Team Sky, and he... I think he's disobeyed team orders slightly and um, I was looking for him after the finish and Chris Froome was within earshot and he heard me say where's Leopold Koenig and he said oh he's probably on the Bora team bus by now um, <laughs> and Koenig of course was going to Bora the following year and he's, he's barely turned a pedal for them still and on their still, still, on, still on their st- books isn't still he? not able to train because of knee problems um, anyway so that that is um, one of the the goatiest of all goat tracks and Vuelta goat tracks because that is um, 4.1 kilometers at 12.3 percent and an obscenely steep climb one of those sort of concrete roads we sometimes see at the Vuelta so that's a, a, a nasty three-day swing um, at the end of the first week and then there's a big stage in Andorra 96 kilometers um, three climbs that almost go to two well almost all of them are um, 2,000 meters um, Landa won at the, well, where we're finishing that day, Cortal Cor- Camp, and um, he won there in 2015. Uh, six, 36 kilometer time trial around Po. Um, then uh, a na- nasty stage finishing in Bilbao in the Basque Country, stage 12. Um, but then you know it sort of dips in and out of, of different mountain ranges. Los <coughs> Los Machucos, fond memories. Mm. 
napalm of us going up there in 2017? Well, that was when our friend Simon Gill, the photographer, um, took over driving responsibilities in your car because uh, both you and your, your cameraman, Scott, were, were too nervous to drive up. It was, it was slightly wet that day as well, wasn't Very it? And wet, the, the roads were pitches ridiculously in, in steep and we were we were struggling in in your car to well there was a bit of wheel spinning and a bit of bit of swearing in the back but we we got the job done we got up there very very um well it's a very difficult climb isn't it They're not least because the surface is so unusual it's kind of concretey ridge slabs rather than a smooth road surface well uh, yeah i mean i said that the mas de la costa was about as goaty as it gets in the world but the, i think um in terms of goatiness um, uh, of the of the gradient, certainly Los Machucos is is right there. Six point eight kilometers at nine point two percent, but that doesn't really do it justice because there's even a bit that goes slightly downhill there. I think um, that's factored into that. There are there are like I say thirty percent gradients on that climb. I'm skipping Andorra. Uh, Richard will be there for Andorra and uh, all the delights that has to offer. As you say, a, a time trial in in France. Uh, Jurançon to Po, um, an opportunity to have a glass of sweet Jurançon dessert wine with dinner, perhaps, um, and then, as you say, back into the Basque country, Los Machucos, and what have I, what's in store for me when I come back out for the final week, the stage to Guadalajara? It's all kind of a, a kind of a horseshoe shape round Madrid, isn't it? The well, final week. Well, I said we we're going to Cantabria for uh, Los Machucos, but then a couple of days in Asturias. Um, probably, I think the d- decisive mountain stages will be those two stages. Stage 15 to Santuario de la, Ch- de la Acebo and stage 16 to La, la Cubilla. Um, because in the last week, there are, there are a couple of mountain stages. So we sort of decamp to the Madrid area in the last week, stages um, 17 inward. And... Um, they're not that hard, the, the last two mountain stages. Um, in the, the Sierra de uh, Gredos, where um, Bernardino sort of built his, his well to win in 1983, famously, there was a famous stage into Avila, which some people say was the, the most memorable, the greatest welter stage of all time. Um, the, we got one climb this year that, that Hino um, sort of turned the screw on in 1983 but there's not that much scope in those stages for for someone to really make a big move and and really turn things around i think the main ground is going to be made up and lost in asturias on stages 15 and 16 and who do we we haven't spoken much at all about richard carapaz um the the giro winner hasn't well hadn't raced until burgos since the giro you know looking at some of these guys um schedules you know that that's a lot of time out out of racing um and he could be in in really good shape in a in a really strong team uh movie star going with the the trident again this time valverde and and quintana one and with soler as well and soler but what one would think that quintana uh fancies it um some uncertainty though with with his future and possibly moving on is he definitely moving on we think he's moving on um I mean, Roglic is the other one, the other sort of outstanding favourite. I mean, they're two podium finishes from the Giro. Those two stand out, really, don't they? Who else are we looking at? I'm kind of curious about Pogacar, Tidy Pogacar, the the, the UAE uh, Team Emirates leader. He's only 20, though, um, so maybe unfair to expect too much from him, but he has been pretty consistent and pretty outstanding this year. I've got Roglic, five stars, Superman, Carapaz four stars and Kreiswick four stars three stars Quintana two stars Pogosar um, Fulsang Chavez Valverde Aru Martinez um, one star Hart Souza and Higita it will be the usual mix though won't it Um, not just in the GC battle but also um, the stages there'll be some some surprises there'll be some riders that we've not seen an awful lot of either um, young riders coming to the fore you know the Vuelta is uh, in recent years it's been a good place for young riders to get the first uh, serious experience of of a grand tour and then you know Every year, Lotto Sudal seem to come up with uh, someone who wins a wins a stage um, from nowhere. I remember uh, Thomas Marczynski won a couple of stages a couple of years ago. Um, Thomas de Gent, of course, completing the Grand Tour 
a clean sweep or set, full set this year, riding the Vuelta after finishing the Giro and the Tour. That's uh, something to watch. Um, I think the one thing that's predictable about the Vuelta is its unpredictability. I mean, you can look at last year's top 10 and think, well, of the riders who are returning, you know, Rigoberto Urand did quite well last year, but does it necessarily follow that he's going to, you know, be contending forgot, for the podium? Forgot Urand in my stars. What do we think? Three stars? Three stars Three. for Urand, yeah. Consistent, isn't and he? If he's, if he's going really well, that bumps up to four. I DJ mean. Van Garderen riding as well. Yeah, they've got a good team. Uh, is Carthy riding? Yes, yeah. Carthy, um, again. I think so. Expe- yeah, expect yet, yeah. expect um, good things from him. I think. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's it's, it's a tough one t- to call. Um, I mean, Phil sang we were only it's only six weeks or so ago that we were talking about him as a favourite for the. The, the Tour de France, has he really slipped down to three stars for well, the Vuelta? Uh, I mean, Fulsang doesn't speak to the press an awful lot these days, but um, I spoke to some Danish colleagues today and they said that um, it, well, he hinted at the end of the Tour de France that he would go to the Vuelta, or oh, sorry, he, he hinted after the Tour de France that he had to pull out of that he was going to the Vuelta uh, mainly to help Superman and, and possibly also to to aim for a couple of stages um, but I, I think he was keeping his options open as far as general classification is concerned but I don't think um, he's putting too much pressure on himself to, to, to go in with the same sort of status as, they, as he had at the Tour A very strong Astana team though and we might see them do it as well to what they failed to do at the Tour um, I've mentioned already but Pogacar what, what would you do with Pogacar what, what would you expect from him I mean in a year when um, Bernal at, at 22 has won has won the Tour de France. I mean, he's a bit younger than that even, but he's already a kind of proven winner. I'm interested to see what they do because Aru um, rode the Tour de France. I think he finished 14th overall, and he's obviously coming back after his um, it was iliac artery operation earlier in the year, um, and and has made sort of quite bullish noises about coming back to. Um, the sort of form that saw him well, win of Welter uh, a few years ago. Um, but how fresh is he going to be after the Tour de France? Um, is he really thinking that he can finish in the top five or, or top ten? Pogacar on reputation on Palmares. Um, Aru would be, should be the leader with Pogacar um, supporting him. But we've seen a lot more from Pogacar in the last year or so, haven't we? Well, lots to look forward to at the Vuelta. Um, we, we heard in last week's episode from Teo Gegenhart, who apparently will lead uh, Team Enios at the Vuelta. But, of course, uh, Ivan Souza's put down a bit of a claim for that too with some... I would say um, it won't be unwelcome, his form, because he was a little bit disappointing at the Giro, I think. And he was the subject of a bit of a tug of, tug of love, wasn't he, between Trek Segafredo and... Team Ineos, Team Sky, as they were last winter, um, a, a much a coveted rider, really, and it uh, looks like he might be starting to deliver on the potential. So, um, the next time you he- you'll hear from us, it will be in Spain at the Vuelta, Lionel with a handkerchief wrapped around, knotted around Steady his head. On. Um, Steady on, sand, <laughs> socks and sandals in Bendor. <laughs> Me and Vinny Samway's bar watching Arsenal. Liverpool. Now, Vinny Samway's bar is in Malaga. I'm sure there's one. Well, sure don't find go one. there, Daniel. That's miles away. <laughs> That's kilometres away. Yeah. Well, listen, before we go this week, let's just say a few quick thanks to friends of the podcast. A reminder, you can sign up as a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. If you do so, you'll be able to listen to Daniel's lunch with Jonathan Vorters, which was released last week. And uh, Daniel's, Daniel's lunch with Jonathan Vorters? Sorry, Lionel's. Did I say Daniel? Yeah, you did. But Lionel's sorry. lunch with Jonathan Vorters. Um, and a tremendous listen that is to very, very personal... Um, uh, and uh, very open and, and revealing Jonathan Vott is in that chat well done Lionel you, thanks Rich you, yeah, we've had a few emails you, actually you from people who, who enjoyed, the, enjoyed the conversation so that's, that's always nice to, to read thank great. you great um, well thank you to friends of the podcast who signed up some time ago Rob Wicks Jennifer Bryden Sharon Chambers Stephen Martin George Sendel Paul Woodman Nick Worthington Paul Locke and Tim Roberts Tara Hodgson, Heidi Erickson, Peter King, Holt Hanna, Hanna Holt? Holt Hanna. I think it's Holt Hanna. Uh, David Arnold, Stephen Rose, Niall Cooling, Andrew Thornton, and Kim Shortreed. And thank you to Felicity Taylor, David Robinson, Jonathan Sage, James Baker, 
Jochen Kindel, Richard Grant, Mark Gilmore and Mark Simpson. Thank you very much. And David Robinson, whose name you missed out as you scan through that list. Two, two David Strangely. Robinsons. There. Oh, sorry. I think he signed sorry. up for two. I'm not... OK, yeah. yeah good. But, but thank yeah, you yeah, twice, anything. David. Thank yeah, you. thanks, David. Thank you, everyone. You've been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. 